I'm just calling this thoughts on leading software teams. So it's a pretty low bar. It's going to be thoughts. That's all. That's all you're getting promised. There definitely will be some. So my name is Jody Hamilton. I work at Renaissance Electronics, which is a large semiconductor company. Uh, we're running a really large Drupal 9 site. Um, and I previously was the CTO of ZipTech mm. since 2008. Um, and this is my 12th bad camp. So when I think about getting into leadership in tech, I kind of think of it as starting as a developer and you are constantly trying to expand your stack when you first get started, right? So you first thing you learn is like HTML, and CSS. Then for most of us, we learn PHP, MySQL, JavaScript, maybe other languages. And then you start to... You know, you have maybe a moment where you think you know something, but then you start to realize there's just all this other stuff that you don't know. And you start to learn about Linux, and you start to learn about uh, running infrastructure, and you learn Vim, and then you have to learn Git, and obviously you learn everything about Drupal. And then people start to get interested in other things. Well, maybe I should learn more about design strategy and accessibility and then for me I started to get into site architecture giving um, site audits for projects I got into business I started a business I got into all kinds of things running that business doing sales team building mentorship staff development these were just all kind of for me, I was just trying to build a good website, but to do that, you start to realize that the problems are not just writing PHP, the problems are bigger and bigger and bigger. How do you have, if you want to do a, a good website, you need a good team. If you want a good team, now you have to learn how to do recruiting and how to retain that team, and how to motivate that team. So the problems just kind of like get broader and broader and broader if you're really interested in trying to solve the, the hard problems. So this has kind of been my, my journey. I became a product owner, um, currently working on a team transformation. And throughout like these 12 times that I've been to Bad Camp, I think I've, I've been here you know, speaking on each of these different topics over, you know, as I've kind of tried to become an expert on one thing after another, I feel like I've, I've come here and I've talked about the Drupal development, I've talked about code quality, I've talked about site architecture, and it was just kind of like one after another. And ultimately, um, I feel like the most important problem that you can solve in your, in your team is really being the leader of the team. It's not, the, the, the technical problems, like the code problems are, are much easier. So, so I sort of accidentally became a leader of a team, um, mainly because I wanted to do bigger projects, and I also just wanted to do something good for other people. So I kind of, as I kind of got into Drupal and became a web developer, I felt like I was making all this good money and I had such a good job doing interesting things. I just kind of felt bad for other people. Like my friends were working at coffee shops and um, I thought, you know, maybe I can try to teach them this stuff and like help other people to get into this. I also ended up starting a business because I felt like I was sort of, had been underestimated in the market. I'd never, I'd always had different jobs where I was sort of treated like a lot less um, capable than I really was. And I thought starting my own business was kind of the only way that I was going to be able to have the type of role that I felt that I should have. 
so I just kind of jumped into that, had really no idea how to do it. And then for many years, just wondered, like, you know, am I actually a successful leader or am I, you know, actually a terrible leader? I think that's what most leaders are thinking. You know, are you, is there something about leadership that you don't know that you haven't been taught? Because almost no one has actually been taught leadership. So this past year I finished my MBA and I thought that one of the things I would learn from that would be finally like what are the actual tricks to be a leader? Like what is what are the rules? Like what is I'm missing? Is isn't that where you go is to go get your MBA and then they're going to tell you this? Well, guess how much of their curriculum actually has to do with being a leader? Yeah, pretty much none. It's all they just teach you how to like how to uh add up the inventory of your like manufacturing business and like and then like run some crunch some numbers about it. They don't actually teach you how to be a leader. Um and part of that is that you can't actually teach people how to be a leader perhaps. Um so maybe it's not a terrible thing that no one actually tries to teach you how cuz you can't really it's not really something you can be taught. Um the only kind of part of like American life where there really is any leadership training that I have found is the military. So the military like takes leadership training like super seriously, but like nowhere else do is there actually like leadership training that I, that I found. But that's okay. It turns out it's actually very easy to become a leader. It's a self-proclaimed thing. So it's kind of similar to like being like a vegetarian or something. You know, you don't have to like actually do anything. You just just if you have the courage to say that you are one, you've qualified. If you can't say that you are one without hemming and hawing and saying, well, maybe I could maybe be a little leader, maybe, you're not one. You, 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 it takes a little bit of courage to just say the words. If you say the words, you're in the club. So that's pretty easy. Um, it, a lot of people, I think, believe that it takes a certain personality type to be a leader and that therefore, because they don't have that personality type, they would never be able to be a leader unless they somehow like faked having that personality type. That's actually not true at all. Um, and personalities can make things easier or harder for you, but they don't, they almost never make something impossible for you. So there is no like personality type. Being a leader is very much like you're taking a walk in the woods with your friends. Who do you want to go in the front and be the leader? The person who knows which way to go. They don't have to have a certain personality. They didn't have to be certified that they were a leader. If they knew which way to go, put them in the front of the group. That's all there is to it. So, if it's pretty easy to become a leader, uh, then why does it seem like we have such bad leadership in tech? And I don't have like any like facts and figures or even know if you could have any to kind of show that there is a leadership crisis in tech, but it definitely feels to me that there is because when you talk to people, if you're interviewing someone to try to hire someone, they tell you all the time that, oh, well, they work where they work like there's there's bad leadership um they don't have they don't have a good direction the people in charge don't know what they're doing um you see not only entire teams that have barely any leadership but whole companies in tech um uh, well, I won't name any perhaps since I'm being recorded, but some large Drupal companies do seem like they have like no one actually like running the show at all. It's just like a whole bunch of engineers just kind of working on different things and it, and it never really comes together or makes any sense. Um, my boyfriend's company is like that. They have like, they have like a hundred engineers and no leadership whatsoever. They all just kind of work on different things they can never get it together and have a product. It doesn't matter how good the engineers are. They don't have anyone to, to bring it together and tell them what they're even should be doing. Um, 
So, it's, a, it's I think, a huge problem. So I think about, like, why do we not have better leaders in tech? I think it has to do with the fact that the people that we need to be the leaders are the, are the top developers. We can't just have, we can't just, like, get our leaders from some totally separate place and then they're going to come in and tell the developers what to do. Like, if you're going to lead the developers, you're going to need to be a developer. So, in order to talk a developer into being a leader is not that easy. Typically, when you talk to developers about leadership, they'll say that they want to be mentors. They like to mentor people. They like to help out the junior developers, maybe do some knowledge sharing or something like that. Rarely do they say they want to, like, officially manage the entire team. And I think the reason for that is it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of emotional energy. Most developers are introverts who are guarding their energy. They don't have extra energy where they're going to be like, wow, I really, I really, like, have all this extra energy that I want to, like, have this extra eight hours of meetings every day and um, have to have all this emotional responsibility and all of this stuff weighing me down all the time. When you're a, a developer, one of the great things about it is you can just turn off your emotions for the entire day, dig into like some serious, crazy problems, the hours fly by, and it's, it's, it's like playing a video game. It's just like an escape. If you have problems in your life, you don't have them while you're programming. You forget about them completely. It's great. You can just like turn off all of the difficult parts of being a human. But to be a leader, you're going to have to go in completely the other direction. And you're going to have to use all of that emotional energy instead of shutting it out. And most of our developers, who are the, the top developers, who are the ones that we really want to be the leaders, these people are usually burned out already. Because when you're a, a good problem solver, and you're in an industry that's full of problems, the problems just keep coming at you faster and faster and faster. You keep trying to do them, and you're, you, there's never a break. You're just like on this treadmill doing these problems faster and faster and faster until you're super burned out. And most developers are pretty burned out. Um, so when you ask them, like, hey, can you take on these additional responsibilities? It's going to be like 20 hours a week of meetings, plus, like, dealing with everything else you're already dealing with, it's not a very attractive offer, especially considering that developers are already paid pretty well. So it's not like they, they need the raise that they're going to get by becoming a manager. So for most people, it just seems like it's not worth it. It's better to just write the code all day and not become a leader. So as a result, teams try to bring in these, like, non-technical leaders. And that rarely goes well. I don't know if anyone's, like, ever had an experience where they had, like, a leader as a developer who wasn't at all technical, and if it's ever gone well. I think it can go well. It's not impossible for it to go well. If that person has um, really good leadership skills in terms of all kinds of soft skills with how they're working with others and getting motivating others and getting others to collaborate with each other, that could work. Um, most, of the, most of the people that I think of who are like non-technical leaders of software teams, they normally, like if you dig into it, they are pretty technical. Right, so they, like they might be, they might not be a back end developer, but then you dig into, you're like, oh, well, they're actually like a pretty good UX designer, or they're actually like a very serious project manager, or like they actually, you know, they, they typically always have some expertise in something that was relevant. It's usually not that they're just like complete outsiders that just kind of wandered in, and um, and succeeded at running this software team. But um, much more often when you have non-technical leadership, 
you get these kinds of guys, and it's like usually guys, um, they, um, their whole kind of thing is that they're going to get some resources, right? So that's like how they're going to like run their software team. We're going to like go out there, like get some more resources, put the resources on it, and then, and then something's going to happen. And that work's going to get done. And you're like, is that actually how software is made? Because it doesn't seem right. So to try to inspire anyone to actually want to be a leader, considering that it's not perhaps always feel like the, the best job compared to just getting to sit there and write code all day, I think the, the main reason um, that's worth doing is if you kind of think about your how you're going to feel about your career at the end of your career, in your old age, and you're looking back, you're not going to care about all of the bugs that you fixed and all of the websites that you made. Like, they're going to just all be immediately forgotten. I can't even remember the bug that I fixed two days ago. It, you just forget it as soon as you do it. It doesn't mean anything to you. There's just another one. It's just like a puzzle that you're solving. But when you look back on your life and you remember, like, the people who you were able to help by leading them, that's something that you'll have your entire life. And that's something that, at the end of the day, just matters a lot more than the actual websites. So, um, so for me, one of the things that I was able to do at ZipTech was, like, bring a lot of people into tech careers. So a lot of people who had like no experience, had never written code, I was able to train them up and get them started in their first tech job. And once they had a tech job, they're set. You know, you always talk to people who are just still trying to break into their first tech job. If you can break into your first tech job, you are, you're fine, you're set. Your whole life is going to be different. You see them buying houses, getting married, having families, like things that they would have never been able to do when they were working at Best Buy or, you know, at the coffee shop or at the Trader Joe's. And so it's like you are able to change people's lives and the lives of their families in a major way. It might be kind of like... And even, and even if you're not, even if it's not as extreme as that, even if it's not as like, oh, you're able to like find someone who had no experience and train them up. Even if it's just, you already have a team, they already have professional jobs, you can still help them to learn things and move forward in their careers and to like elevate them to a higher role and just everything that you're that you're doing as a leader that is elevating other people um, is ultimately, I think, just something that you can feel a lot better about yourself than just like being like a code monkey your whole life. So one of the kind of corny but true things about leadership is it's, it's all based on values. So it's, it is very corny. People always tell you this. It's completely true. The, to, to, have, to be a leader, you have to be values-based. You have to think about what your values are. They're typically going to be human-based values because as leaders, what we are leading is other humans. Um, so for me, some of the values that I think about a lot are trying to elevate others, um, cultivating compassion, Authenticity, transparency, vulnerability, um, and overall, just to place a high premium on the individual talent of people and their creative potential. Because I know for myself, in my experience, when I have passion and um, and I and I apply myself to it. I can do things that, you know, a hundred unmotivated people would never be able to do. And I think we all know that. Like, one person who's 
creative and talented and has passion for what they're doing is capable of doing so much more than than you could than you could ever imagine. So it's not like so that's why it makes no sense to talk about people as resources. It's not there's they're not like a resource and we'll get another resource and they get another resource. Okay, we have three resources. So if we get one more then we'll be you know, that'll be thirty three percent more resources. People don't are not like linear commodities. You can sort of activate someone's creativity in some way, and all of a sudden that person becomes a hundred times more valuable. They have some breakthrough ideas. They start to collaborate with each other and f be able to figure out things that they would have never been able to figure out. So it's like, if you, you have, it's, it's I mean, it's a, it's a talent based, it's a creative pursuit. It's sort of like, um, professional sports or or music where it's where one person might be incredible um but people are not you know all the same and so yeah to me i think that's like the biggest my biggest value that i try to hold on to now the great thing about values is that they're not the same as your personality so it makes it sound like, oh, these are my values. Wow, you must be like a really a nice, great person. Not at all. My personality is like the complete opposite of the values. That's okay. <laughs> these are more aspirational. That's okay. Like you can embrace the hypocrisy. You know, to be a leader, you don't have to be like perfect or like even like a great person or have a great personality you want you, you it's you need to have these values that you're going for but you don't need to beat yourself up every day that you haven't achieved these values like your value is elevating others but you're pissed off and tired and miserable so you didn't say hello to anyone in any meetings today <laughs> whatever you know that does that doesn't make you a failure you still have your values and, you know, you're a person with limited energy, and, and you're just going to have to do your best. So, the other side of uh, values is culture. So, culture on a team is incredibly important. And when you interview people who are looking for a new job, they talk about this all the time, that the reason that they're unhappy at their current job is the culture. They don't come and say, hey, they're applying for a new job because they're not paid well enough and they want to, like, come and get paid more. They don't come and say, they don't usually come and say, like, oh, I, I don't like the, the tech stack that we're working on. Um, I want to work on some different problems. That's what's going to motivate me to find a new job. No, they're leaving companies because the culture of the company sucks. And they want to work with good people in a better culture. So if culture is that important, that it's like what gets you to be able to attract employees or lose employees um, and retain employees, but it's also like their energy level and their passion and their ability to, to work together. So it's actually incredibly important. But um, it's... You know, it's one of those kind of like soft things. And as developers, we tend to like hard logical problems. And it kind of is hard for us to say like, okay, we need to like get into like this squishy emotional stuff. But it is really the heart of, of the problem. So in terms of culture, I think you can often as a leader not, you can underestimate how much you influence the culture. When you are having a bad day or a good day, it rubs off on the entire team in ways that aren't totally obvious all the time. But you should try to remember that everything that you're doing is is influencing the culture. But, you know, again, try not to beat yourself up about it. Um, so for setting the tone, to me, I think a, a, t a successful culture of a software team needs to be respectful, which means you can't have someone on your team who's like this arrogant ass who makes fun of people when they write bad code. No matter how bad the code is, you can't make fun of people. You gotta, you know, be direct that this is, you know, 
needs work and how we're going to change it. But if you shut people down, they'll never open back up again. And the whole goal with a team culture is that the team works together very closely. When you have a team that's like collaborating very closely, they act like a single brain with like all of these different parts to the brain connected. They know when and who to ask at every time they have an issue. And that person is right there with the information that they needed and to teach them something. And they know, well, this guy is the expert on this and she's really great at this. And they're right there like at your fingertips in Slack and they're telling you what you need to know. You might be the kind of developer that can solve any problem yourself. That's fine. But if you're the kind of developer that could probably solve any problem themselves, but you work with the rest of the team to solve your problems as quickly as possible, that's much more effective. You can solve any problem yourself given infinite time, but your goal is to get through the problems as quickly and efficiently as possible, which means calling on your teammates um, and working well together. To do that, you have to trust each other that no one's ever going to make fun of each other for making a mistake um, and that, you know, everyone is going to be like support each other and it's okay to ask a stupid question and not know things and that you don't have to ever be concerned that someone's going to mistreat you because of that. If you have someone like that on your team who mistreats people, no matter how good of a developer they are, that you have to get them off of the team if you can't get them to change their behavior because that'll ruin your entire culture. Most cases, um, you don't have to fire them. Most cases, uh, if you let them know it's unacceptable, they can adjust their behavior. Um, so another sort of important part of culture is to have a teaching culture where everyone on the team understands that taking that moment to teach one another is always a good thing. And it doesn't matter how busy you are and how much is going on, that nothing's really more valuable than taking that extra moment with your colleague to teach them about the, the problem that they're trying to solve right at that moment. Um, if you get your team to start to value teaching and mentoring each other, the team um, just just grows in their quality and, and how much they can do. And you can have and you can get to the point where you can bring in junior developers and the senior developers can mentor that person up just through day-to-day -day interactions until that person is very quickly a senior developer too. And that's the ideal. Um, another kind of important part of the culture is to always try to share successes, elevate people, thank people, you know, just throw them some thumbs up emojis. It only takes like a second. It's corny, but you know, it makes a difference to in people's day. Um, and if you do these things to take care of your people, you will not only have them collaborating better and be more motivated, but, but you'll retain them and they'll be loyal to you and listen to you and be able to work together with you. So I'm actually really lucky to have had people that, um, that I led at ZipTech that are coming to my new team, um, because, you know, because no matter you know, the bad days that we had over the years that they know that I'll always have their back, that I'll always take the blame and share the success with them, that it's, there's never going to be a time when they sent a bug to prod and they get yelled at because I decide that they're an idiot and they should have never did that. Um, so it, it, it pays off. Breaking down class system, this is, this is an issue everywhere, but I think it's especially true on the corporate level. So in every tech team, there are naturally 
forming class system. Well, I don't know if they're naturally forming, but they tend to form. So some of the class systems that form are like um, around uh, like your employment status. So in most teams, like there can be a mixture of people who are full-time, contractor, and, and vendor people. And it's what happens a lot is that turns into a class system, right? Where the, the contractors or the people who are working for a vendor, for a staff org, are treated poorly. And the full-time people are treated much better. That is not um, because um, of malicious reasons, I don't think. I think it happens that way because people have limited energy and they think to themselves like, okay, well, this group of people works for a vendor, so the vendor can worry about being nice to them and supporting them and taking care of them. We already have all these other people that, to deal with, so we don't have time for them. We're not even gonna like talk to them or try to get to know them really or treat them like human beings. Well, that's a, a missed opportunity. It's not just, it's not that, it's not just that it's wrong to treat some people better than others, which it is, I believe. It's not just that it's wrong, it's, 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 it's an enormous missed opportunity. It's a, it's a talent-based industry. So if you, if, you, if you don't put the effort into supporting and nourishing and um, recognizing people's talents and trying to elevate them, you will miss out on the opportunity of them being able to do much bigger things than when you treat them like they're some kind of a tool. Um, so it's actually your loss to kind of treat people like less than a full human being that can, that can do as the same as anyone else. Um, some of the other class systems that you run into are like this, there's like a weird class struggle between technical and non-technical people, especially in the corporate world. So there's, um, so, and they, it, that's a kind of like works in, from both sides. A lot of technical people don't respect non-technical people and think that they're just these sort of like mindless stakeholders who are just have like random whims that they're like coming at us with. Um, and are just really ultimately not very smart people if, because they're unable to write code. So there's like a bit of like that, that side of the bias. And then from the other side, uh, a lot of people who are non-technical people ha treat technical people like they are a resource or a tool or just somehow less than a fully human person. And that is like, for me, pretty unbearable, and um, and it's also crazy because sometimes it will extend to you even when you even when you like are doing the the strategy work and you're and you're doing non technical work with these non technical people. Sometimes they will still see you because the because you know how to write code that makes you less than because. A coder is some type of like a interchangeable laborer that does some sort of like dirty work of some sort. And so like they, if they know, if once they classify you as a technical person, you're now like in a lower status. Not everyone and not everywhere acts like that, but for some reason, some people do act like that, and that's like the culture of their, of their companies, like treat developers like that. It doesn't really make any sense, considering that developers are smart people, and they actually are people who are capable of everything else that the other people are doing. Um, it's, they're not like weird robots that are like missing something that, that other people have. I mean, my only theory for, for why that happens is that it's just like a type of way to protect themselves and to like make them feel um, 
like they must feel in some way threatened by people that can write code. So they must just have to come up with some rationale why they're better than those people. Uh, but it's it's all kind of the the a big problem because when your whole thing that you're trying to accomplish with with these teams and as a leader is to get people to work together and so that means they need to work together with like the technical people and the non-technical people and um every one of these different systems that separates people is an obstacle to you actually having a high performing team so a lot of times your role as a leader in a large organization is just continuously trying to um, connect people, break down barriers between people, get rid of walls that are separating groups, and get them to be able to communicate with each other and treat each other well. Um, because as soon as you as soon as you kind of like break down one wall, you find somewhere else that a wall is going up. So it's just like an ongoing thing that you need to do. Um, one of the terrible parts of being a leader is that you have to fire people. And um, I just thought I would mention that because it's, it's, a, it's one of the reasons people don't want to be a leader. It's something that no one wants to do. And there are a lot of leaders who um, just can't handle it and that it's easier to just kind of keep people than to fire them. Um, so that happens all the time, that there's like teams where a lot of people should have gotten cut and they have not gotten cut um, because people are just afraid to, to be the bad guy and, and have to do that. So I would say it's extremely valuable if you are able to assess um, the performance people in your team and you have enough courage to be able to cut them, you will be able to have a much better team. Um, the One of the problems with non-technical leaders of teams is that they have no idea how to assess the performance of the people on the team. So they can have people on the team that are very bad, low performers, and they can <coughs> easily be fooled that those people are are doing fine and the, you know, the team is never able to be successful um, because they're not able to figure it out. Okay, so, so, what are, yeah. so one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that I'm doing now, in the past I, I was able to start a team from the beginning and I had to grow that team, and I had to um, maintain that team and bring in people, but it was always the same team. I didn't have to um, build multiple teams. I just had one team, I had the same people stuck around for 10 years. Now I've taken on a team that is an already existing team, and my challenge is to transform it into being a high performing team. So I think that a really good way to approach that problem is to follow the agile principles. Um, there's a few things that are good about that. First of all, when you're trying to like change, uh, change a team, it's a lot better to be able to like point to some widely accepted principles than to kind of come in with your own principles that you then have to like defend and are just kind of, people can easily kind of say, well, that's just her wacky weird shit that she's into. Nobody can like, nobody's gonna say I'm into wacky weird shit if what I'm arguing is just the principles from the Agile Manifesto, All right? So, so the Agile Manifesto and the principles that go along with it are very well respected across the entire software industry. So, as you, and these are the principles that are part of the Agile Manifesto. So, it's not like all the kind of rules of, of like Scrum, it's just the wider, just like 
agile philosophy. So when you're transforming a team, there's a million things that you have to do because you need to change the culture, you need to improve the processes, you need to do hiring, you need to do firing, you need to change um, the structures of the teams, you need to uh, find your leaders and empower your leaders, you need to have, um, you need to like, start knowledge sharing sessions, you, there's a, just like a million things you have to do and to figure out which things you should do first and how to think about those things, I think these principles are really useful. So you can kind of go through each one of these and then reflect on your team, what is the next step that we could take to do better with this principle, right? So you can kind of find like an actionable step for each of these. So um, for example, number three, deliver working software frequently, right? So you reflect on that. Okay, well, we deliver working software every two weeks and it's not really frequently enough and it's not very automated. So one of the things that we need to do on our team is to automate those deployments and shift a lot of parts of our process left so that we can start to deliver working software more frequently. So that's one of like our process changes and our, and our infrastructure changes that we need to make. Um, number four, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. So that's another wall that you need to break down. If, you have, if your business people and your developers are not interacting directly, which is common, you need to figure out what are the steps that we can take to improve that. Do we need to schedule some meetings? Do we need to get people to know each other? Do we need to invite some different people into Slack? Um, do we need to ask the business to do some presentations to the development team? Um, or do we just need to like make sure that the development team knows that they're empowered to reach out to the business and that that's valued and that you know the business isn't like someone that you should be ignoring because because you know don't bother them they're they're too busy or whatever um so yeah i think these are these are very useful to kind of just each one of these each one of these principles if you really dig into it and reflect on it um can lead to all sorts of you know, different projects and ways that you can improve your team. So they're, they're, they look like they're just like a short sentence, but when you like really dig into them, there's a lot in, in each one. And I really, like, I really like a lot of them. Like this one, simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. So how are you going to apply that to your team or get them to understand that? But it's not about writing more code and more code and more code, but like figuring out how to perhaps get rid of a bunch of code and, and do less. So that is all I have got. I think I had some thoughts. And um, my um, call to action is hit me up on LinkedIn if you would like a job. We have a... Um, opening for a senior Drupal developer and for a DevOps lead. And we are making a very awesome team. So if you know anyone or you're interested, please um, find my LinkedIn. That's my advertisement portion. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>